Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel called Improving Equity, Pay, and Working Conditions for Childcare and Pre-K Workers in the Caring Ecosystem. My name is Jennifer Lee, and I'm a Senior Policy Analyst at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, and I will be moderating this panel today. Our theme for the conference today is treating care workers as essential, not invisible. And perhaps nowhere else has this become more evident that care workers are essential than for families with young children. Yet this work hasn't been so much invisible, I would argue is undervalued. As we talked about in the panel, in the conversation right before this one, society assumes that women will take on this work and these narratives are pervasive and rooted in both racism and sexism in our society. Care work is essential work that is unpaid within families and is underpaid for many professional care workers. And much of that burden falls on women and women of color. I'm sure I am not the only one who was reminded of how essential this work really is as we endured um, child care closures last week <laughs> because of the recent COVID surge. And the situation for many families was not sustainable even before the pandemic. And the pandemic really just broke the crisis open for so many families in Georgia and across the US. Now, family policies in the US and Georgia have long had pretty limited support for families with young children. There is limited state investment in supporting families with childcare costs unless you are very low income. Georgia's pre-K investment has long been lauded, but still leaves many young children behind in the state. And for the individuals who work in childcare and pre-K, the majority of whom are women of color, the work is a labor of love, but they are often paid wages that mean that they struggle to support families themselves. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that the annual mean salary for a child care worker in Georgia is a little over $21,000 today. So inadequate investments from the public sector means that families struggle to pay. It means that workers are paid low wages and also that communities, employers, and the economy feel the effects of many families who are just stretched too thin. Um, Aijun Pu, who is the co-founder and executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, spoke at our conference several years ago to talk about care work as fundamental to the economy. And she often talks about it as um, care work being equivalent as physical infrastructure in our society today. And we understand that we need functioning roads, bridges, and now internet connections to be able to go to work. Uh, but even with all those things, I think the last couple of years has taught us that we need care just as much as we need roads and bridges to go to work every day. So please feel free to use the conference platform to chat with each other, uh, introduce yourselves to each other and ask questions. We will reserve about 10 minutes at the end of this panel discussion for Q&A, and if we run out of time, we will note your questions and follow up afterwards. You can also connect with each other, uh, other attendees within the conference platform, including the panelists. And last but not least, if you do use Twitter, please remember to use the hashtag insights22. So without further ado, I will um, briefly introduce our panelists today. First is Maritza Morelli, the executive director of the nonprofit Los Niños Primero, based in Sandy Springs, Georgia. And her experience includes working with the Department of Education in Venezuela as a family interpreter for Northside Hospital, the lead bilingual community liaison for Fulton County Schools, and now is the leader of Los Niños Primero, which provides educational programming for Latino children and families throughout Metro Atlanta. Brittany Collins is the founding director of PACT, Promise All Atlanta Children Thrive, which is led by GEARS, the Georgia Early Education Alliance for Ready Students. PACT is a citywide alliance of public and private partners focused on improving the academic health and well being outcomes for young children birth to five in the city of Atlanta. 
Elizabeth Casper is the Deputy Commissioner for Federal Programs at the Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning, or DECAL. She is responsible for administering the Child Care and Parent Services, or CAPS, program, which provides child care subsidies and scholarships for families with low incomes. And she also has previous experience working in the Child Care Services Division at DECAL and as a center director. And last but not least, we have Dr. Stephen Owens, Senior Policy Analyst at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Prior to leading the elementary and secondary education work at GBPI, Stephen was an analyst at the Georgia Department of Education, and he holds a, a doctorate from the University of Georgia with a focus on education policy. And a fun thing that I learned about our panelists in preparing for today is that all of them actually have classroom experience <laughs> and experience working directly with schools, which is just good to see. Um, so, all right, without further ado, we'll go into the some of our questions here. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, challenges accessing, accessing high quality and affordable childcare and pre-K existed before the pandemic for many families and COVID-19 of course created some new ones as well. So, uh, Elisabetta, I'd like to start with you. What are some of the challenges you've observed statewide um, before the pandemic and then during the pandemic, what are some um, new trends or experiences that you've noticed? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, as we look at the landscape of childcare, you may have heard about programs closing in widespread childcare deserts, at least on the national level. However, in Georgia, that's not the case. That's not really what we've seen. From mid-March 2020 to the beginning of January 2022, the number of licensed child care learning centers in Georgia actually increased by 0.6% from 3,075 to 3,093. While the number of licensed family child care homes did decrease 8.3% from 1,373 to 1,259. There were two main challenges that we saw for child care programs in Georgia. First, we saw enrollment plunge across all facilities to an all-time low around April of 2020, and, and, and I would say it was roughly at 11% of pre-pandemic levels in April of 2020. So that was the lowest that it hit the whole time that we know of, at least. And then a very slow increase after that. While enrollment is much higher now, today, it is still has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. The second major challenge we saw were with staffing in programs. As enrollment increased, this issue became more and more pronounced. In some cases, there was demand from families, but programs were unable to open entire classrooms due to a lack of sufficient staff to care for the children. I think it's important to note that childcare was never closed down in Georgia. And while many programs temporarily closed in the earlier parts of the pandemic, some have remained open the entire time to serve their communities, and they should be commended for the commitment that they have had to help families. Parents need childcare to go to work, and some parents don't have the option to work from home. Many of the initiatives DECAL used federal stimulus funds for focused on financially supporting programs while enrollment is low, assisting the child care workforce also with financial payments and helping families to pay for child care as they were also feeling the effects of the pandemic. Thank you. <clears throat> um, if anyone else could jump in, what would what were you seeing in terms of challenges both before the pandemic and uh, during the pandemic, uh, from your vantage point, it, uh, from as a provider, uh, or with your program. Um, okay, in in our case, in Los Niños Primero, we see that our Latino population have a lack of information or limited access to quality childcare programs, and we also um, see that transportation is really an issue. And uh, sometimes uh, also the accessibility uh, to resources like a child care available in the area, they don't have that information. So it's like a, um, the lack of uh, 
resources and information and also um, resources in transportation to take the children to uh, different uh, childcare <laughs> facilities. And shifting a little bit, you know, I think one of the um, themes of the conference that was highlighted so well in the, the conversation in our opening kickoff session is really how we center women and women of color in the care conversation. And so I want to talk a little bit about how the pandemic related challenges have affected equity and racial ethnic equity um, in, in the state. You know, we've seen obviously that there are issues that pre exist the pandemic related to racial ethnic equity in, in the care ecosystem, but how has the pandemic specifically, you think, affected some of those issues in the state? Well, I can start by really thinking about our work in city of Atlanta. So, you know, we think about a neighborhood facing decades of disinvestment pre-pandemic and the experience of a family struggling to locate or pay for childcare um, data in 2018 showed about 32% of Atlanta's demand for childcare was unmet, and that demand was concentrated in neighborhoods and that experienced uh, high rates of concentrated poverty. So even when childcare was available, paying for childcare was often difficult for families as they were paying close to 40% of their income. And in some cases, that means that even pre-pandemic, paying for care was hard post, well, I don't want to say post-pandemic, now that we're still living through this, if a family even has access to high quality child care in their neighborhood, but they don't have the funding, that means the families are making a difficult decision of, do I put my child in um, maybe an unlicensed care situation, or do I have to leave the workforce altogether? Um, and at the same time, our child care industry is collapsing and it continues to collapse as providers are grappling with increased costs to serve children during the pandemic or declined enrollment. So I really think that this pandemic has brought into stark contrast the vulnerabilities that families with young children face and particularly how that's played off, how that's played out with families um, of color. So true. And Elizabeth, I see you shaking your head there, um, nodding in agreement, <laughs> not shaking your head now. But uh, is there anything else that you kind of see from the state level perspective in terms of the pandemic's effects? Sure, sure. I think Brittany said it very well. Um, the, I, I would just echo really what she said that the issue, there were issues that already existed prior to the pandemic particularly with access to high quality childcare for families, and even to, for example, supports for children with disabilities. And the pandemic really just exacerbated all those issues and made them worse. I think that's in a nutshell, the best way to, to characterize. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna jump a little bit into the budget, <laughs> since Georgia Budget and Policy Institute uh, just focus on, on the budget and state investments. Um, so as a state budget and policy organization, GBPI tracks the effects of state investment or lack thereof on the well-being of Georgians. And as mentioned earlier, there's been, um, I think, pretty limited and in inadequate public investments, both at the state and federal level in pre-K and child care and just sort of family policy for young children. And so again, this has had sort of negative effects for families, for employers, for the workers themselves. And so Stephen, I was wondering if you could just offer us a little bit of budget context about um, state investments and spending on not only child care and, and pre-K, but also human services writ large um, so if we could just start there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so as Jennifer mentioned, we're, Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, uh, budget is literally our middle name. And uh, we believe that the budget is a moral document saying who deserves uh, the wealth and resources of the state and, and who uh, ought to be kept out. And policies kind of bear 
that out. And I was able to um, help implement a survey last year of Georgia pre-K providers. So this is uh, Georgia's pre-kindergarten program, which is uh, available to all student, all four-year-olds in the state of Georgia. There's about 84,000 slots uh, to provide uh, pre-kindergarten services for these kids. And in prepping for that, we were able to kind of see, okay, what are the um, what are the funding trends for this program? So if we kind of zoom in on Georgia's pre-K, um, and then I'd love to compare that not only to past years, but also to what we see in our K through 12 program, because that's, that's an education system that we understand, you know, we have a better sense of like kind of how the state invests in it. And so uh, Georgia was one of the first states in the nation to have this universal pre-K program. Uh, which is offered to every four-year-old. And uh, we spend recently spent about $375, $383 million. But there was a big change that happened in the wake of the recession when the state was facing just like really difficult budget years um, where they raised the class size from uh, one lead teacher for every 20 students to one lead teacher for every 22 students. And so now that's what the state will reimburse centers for. That doesn't mean that that's the class size of your child. It just means that's the amount that's going to be paid for by the state. Um, and in that kind of difficult moment, we've never in the years since gone and, and made that change back where we had several years of economic expansion in the state of Georgia. Uh, we're sitting on $1 billion of unrestricted funds and the lottery funds, which, uh, which pay for our Georgia pre-K program. Uh, we, still have, uh, we still pay centers for one lead teacher and one assistant teacher for every 22 students instead of for every 20. Um, and so again, looking at those larger numbers, one of the things I'd like to focus in on is fiscal year 22. That's the year that we are in right now. We're gonna spend $383 million unless um, the governor's amended budget passes. But let's say $383 million for Georgia's pre-K for 84,000 students. Conservatively, we'll spend about $1.4 billion for the kindergarten grade. And it's not like, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids pop out of nowhere. We do have more kids in our kindergarten program than we do in Georgia pre-K, but let's look at it per student. That's uh, $4,500 per child in Georgia pre-K. That's almost $12,000 per child in kindergarten. And it shows just like we have this constitutional requirement for a kindergarten uh, through 12th grade program, but we can have similar investment for kids in younger grades. Um, and one of the things we learned in the survey is that only 32% of pre-K providers said the amount of funding that they were getting is adequate. In order to make up the difference uh, for their needs, they would have to raise tuition rates on their uh, zero to three-year-olds. Um, so you can see what it looks like to not invest in one program that Georgia has it trickles down to every other part of the program. And one thing I was struck by that I think we, we've talked about in our pre-planning for this meeting, nobody's getting rich in childcare, <laughs> but it is absolutely able to make people poor. But they, like, there is just so much that's required to make sure you are operating a fully functional center that does right by kids, that keeps them safe, that meets the standards that we have uh, for quality childcare, um, that no one is you know, getting the bag from this but it can, it can command so much of a family's paycheck just so that they can then have a job. And we would hear these stories from childcare providers uh, who are taking out personal loans just to keep their centers open, uh, who are dedicating hours of their staff just to uh, apply for federal grants, just to keep it open. Um, the state of Georgia doesn't reimburse for capital improvements. Like uh, if something happens to your roof or your AC, that money has to come from somewhere. So it's going to come from that zero to three space. And we see that kind of in child care across the system is that uh, we're kind of late. In the, we, we started off with a lead in the, our universal pre-K program, but now like we, we're leaving this program to, um, without kind of that significant investment it needs to keep up in the, in the 21st century. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, especially those budget numbers, I think, between pre-K and kindergarten investment are definitely very eye-opening. 
And and Brittany, I know that you've done some work too, sort of looking at that that financial difference between you know, child care and then the, the K-12 or pre-K system in, in your work. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that work that you've done. Yeah, so um, while GEAR's work is definitely thinking about the, our work at the state level, the benefit of PACT is thinking about the connection or the connectivity between work that that's happening at the state, but also the impact at the local level. So one thing that we have focused a lot on through the PACT initiative locally is pay parity. And, you know, just for clarity on the definition, we think pay parity is the state, our condition of being equal, especially regarding status or pay. And in current ECE debates, it typically refers to the comparison between the compensation of a pre-K teacher and the compensation of a teacher that teaches K-12. Um, in fact, one of GEAR's state legislative priorities is advocating for increased funding to Georgia's pre-K program to ensure that pre-K teachers pay is on par with K-12 teachers and to increase pre-K assistant teacher pay. Um, in Georgia, only about 69% of as pre-K assistant teachers are actually retained annually over the last four years. And of course, no surprise, research shows that a significant factor in early childhood educators' desire to leave or stay in the classroom or the field is dedicated to low pay. Um, and what we also know is that things differ significantly across districts. So this is an issue of consideration, not only at the state level, but the local level as well, especially because Georgia has the amazing benefit of having a mixed delivery system. Um, I would like to shout out our partner, um, Atlanta Public School and their Board of Education, a couple of years ago committed to pay parity for their pre-K teachers and paraprofessionals to really help retain and adequately compensate the top talent in the district that cares for their youngest learner. So, you know, there's there are some bright spots happening, but simply put, I think adequate public investment and policies are necessary to ensure the professionals who care for and educate our youngest children are respected, well-trained, and appropriately compensated. Thank you. And Maritza, just to turn to you for a minute, because I know Los Niños Primera also provides pre-K services to many of your families. I was wondering if you just had any other um, thoughts about um, not only, you know, just pay and access, but just what you've seen, you know, with your, your pre-K families um, during this pandemic. Okay, I, I need to <laughs> unmute myself. Um, yes, thank you, Jennifer. And um, in terms of uh, Los Niños Primero, I, I wanted to give a, a perspective of what the organization does because uh, we, we have been providing educational service and early childhood education for 21 years to Latino uh, community. And uh, one of the reasons is because the Latino immigrants need extra help and uh, that the school um, system provide. And when we, we see our Latino community enter to pre-K or kindergarten, we see them uh, two years or three years behind compared to peers. So one of the thing, very important thing that we do is to complement or prepare the kids before they enter the school. Of course, our organization go beyond the early childhood and early years. Uh, we provide support to the way to college, but I'm going to be concentrating in what we did during the, the pandemic uh, to support the families uh, and especially to see what the teachers also uh, did during the pandemic. And when we look at our organization and our community, we look at this as a, a very organic and um, complete um, a team of pieces that work together. And uh, we, the first thing that we did during the pandemic was to make sure that we have information of what the families need in order to support them. So we provide a service and uh, we find out that 80% of our family lost the job or have a reduced reduction in their hours work. And most of the parents, our parents work in the food industry. 
And that was one of the things that was more hit during the, the pandemic. So we, we provide uh, financial assistance so they can stay in their home and uh, they won't become homeless because we actually support some of the family for three or more months paying the rent. So that is um, make uh, us sure that the family stay uh, more stable financially that they can um, provide. So um, knowing that we were helping them with uh, medical bills and uh, financial stability, paying the rent and also with services, um, provide also a really environment for the parents to be able to help the kids in the educational in the educational area. So we we in that sense because our parents also have a lack of information in terms of all the uh, platforms that they need to use in order to connect with our teachers. So we provide computers to them and also not only computer making sure that they have the internet assistance and also technical assistance. So they can have someone really can teach them how to use the platform that the kids need in order to connect with the kids. So that was, that was very well needed before they entered to uh, have uh, the, um, the learning through the uh, internet. So, now the, the teachers did a fantastic job putting together a program that was designed to, to provide all the academic needs that the, the kids, our kids needed. The other challenge that we face is that when the kids go to class, they have all the material in the class. But this time, because they were at home, we need to provide them with the academic material that they will need in order for the teacher to deliver the learning. So, um, so we provide them, each child has what we call the academic backpack. So that was another uh, thing that we have to provide to making sure that the kids really was taking advantage of the program that we were offering. Uh, we also adapt the schedule of the classes, um, taking in consideration the parents' needs. So um, when we develop, when the teachers develop the classroom experience, they have to take in consideration the ages of the children. So the attention span because it's through the internet, they have to be reinvented the way that they can communicate with the kids so they can get the attention. And the parents needed to be there. So that was another uh, way that we support the parents. We make sure that the time that we select for this group of kids, which they have to be very a small group of kids that at once the, the teacher was teaching, um, fixed in the, the, teach the parents' schedule. So the other things that we saw that really how it's very, very important is that the distress that the pandemic brought to the Latino community create emotional instability. The stress level resulted in family, some of the families separate, some of the team deprivation among the peers was uh, you know, showing um, sign of depression. Parents could not see solution, a situation that aggravate the many um, uh, ex life experience that they were going through. So, and they did not qualify for social services. So Los Niños Primero create a space to, for them to share and to feel the community support. So we create a, um, a program that we call Among Friends 
and there was a space where the parents have to talk and uh, and share their their worries. And we also offer a cognitive based compassion and training designed for Emory uh, University that empower the parents uh, to be more um, to develop skills to manage stress. So that is um, the way we, we were supporting our families during the pandemic and especially the teacher. Um, the teachers, they were also affected by the pandemic and we made sure that they have the support they need to deliver the academic content to our students. We support them by making sure parents understood their role and responsibility in the process and felt part of the solution. The family engagement coordinators were making sure that the parents or care caregiver follow our requirements, such as be present with the camera on and no distraction during the instructional time. So this alleviated the teacher and allowed them to concentrate on delivering the academic content. Um, we also were be able to provide them with the extra financial incentive. So because we knew that they did really work harder to make sure that our kids uh, received the support they needed during the, the pandemic. And we, um, with now we are transitioning to in-person. So things are getting, and getting better. But um, one thing that is important for the audience to know is that when you bring the services, when you work directly with the families, you need to be very creative and also very um, attentive of the need of the population that you are working with mm -hmm. and make sure that you bring solution to what they are going through and, um, and do the best you can because we are all affected by this um, pandemic. I hope this uh, responds your your question. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and that's amazing. And I think it's an amazing reminder for us all that, you know, individual children and, you know, workers are really embedded in, in families and communities and there's just a lot going on. And also a great reminder from an equity perspective that even though, you know, the pandemic has been global in the past two years, um, different families and communities have really experienced this very differently. Um, and I think you you can see that, you know, when you said that 80% of your families um, were out of work. Brittany, you see that in the communities you serve in Atlanta and Elizabetta, the CAPS program focusing really on, on low income families. Not everyone experienced this pandemic the same way. So, mm -hmm. um, so just being really mindful of that, I think, in our in our practices and our policies. Um, before I look forward, I just want to give anyone else a, another chance to just like talk about um, a little bit, continue with that with that theme of sort of, you know, knowing that different communities experience this pandemic differently. You know what what were some of the impacts you saw on families and some of the um, different efforts that that you all had to do to just pay special attention to that? Brittany, Brittany or Elizabetta? Um, I was just gonna say, as I was listening to Maritza, it really reminded me of a conversation that I had with a child care provider in Clayton County who was trying to help me to understand what they were going through. Mm -hmm. and, and this was more at the time where there was a lot of virtual learning going on. Um, so not as much recently, but you know, at that time when a lot of schools were closed and a lot of virtual learning was happening. So you may or may not realize that at a child care program, you can have children from different elementary schools that attend that child care program. Those different elementary schools may have different schedules. So try to envision a child care program putting all these school age kids into a classroom because they have kids in the other classrooms. They're trying to keep the numbers small, socially distanced, they don't have laptops. So if the school provided a laptop to the child, 
then they, you know, they can bring the laptop. Some families didn't want to bring the laptop, even though that was PSN, Mm -hmm. because they were worried about what might happen to the laptop at the child care program. They had to bring their child to child care because they had to go to work if they didn't have the luxury of working at home. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine for a child care teacher who typically maybe has school age children, like maybe that is the age group that she serves, she is having to help balance schedules of one child who's eating lunch, another child who's doing math class, and another child who is um, doing something physical like gym or something like that, all right next to each other. Like it sounded like absolute mass pandemonium when she described it to me. And she's like, I don't know if we can keep doing this. This is too hard. And I think I didn't understand that part. Like you kind of think, oh yeah, kids doing virtual learning from childcare, that's a good solution. But they needed a lot of resources and a lot more help. And those teachers needed support because they never, you know, had, had had to support children doing virtual learning before, which is a different ball game, having to help them log in like to, to Zoom and whatever other platforms different schools were using. So I just highlight all that because I know I didn't ever think about it in that way until I talked to that child care provider who really, you know, gave me an education. Um, And I thought it's really good information as you're thinking about these issues and thinking about how many resources. So of course, families need the resources of, you know, with virtual, with the internet, you know, and internet access and all and, and equipment to be able to use. But um, in addition to that, like even child care programs in order to support these children need um, a whole lot, too. So mm-hmm. just thought it was interesting as I listened to Maritza um, to, to contrast um, mm-hmm. some similar experiences that other child care mm-hmm. providers share with me. Mm-hmm. And um, thank you for that, Elizabeth. And and I just want to conclude by returning uh, before we go to the Q and A. And just as a reminder, you can use ask uh, your questions in the Q and A, and uh, I'll direct it to the um, panelists here. Um, but I want to return back to the workers because we really have wanted to focus sort of on the individuals and professionals who work um, with early care and learning in our state today, and. Um, You know, at GBPI, we like to talk about a people-powered vision for the state uh, and really center people in our conversations. And when we talk about education or childcare, I mean, that is profoundly (laughs) people-centered. When, um, you know, we're talking about the potential of young children and the care and education of young children, but on the worker side, I mean, one of the reasons, as Stephen said, is that no one's getting rich off of childcare or pre-K is that it relies on people to do the work. It's not work that we can outsource, that we can automate, that there are like these technological innovations of scale (laughs) to have a one-on-one interaction with a young child. And so so, um, I'd like all of you to kind of discuss this last question a little bit, to think about the people and the investments in providers and staff and teachers, just what was um, an important lesson or takeaway that you've learned from the past two years about how we should think differently about our investments in the people that power childcare and pre-K in Georgia and how we could improve the system overall uh, with that lens. Um, I I will start saying, because I've been thinking a lot about this and uh, the one of the things that we have been neglecting for so many years in education in general is the importance of mental health. Uh, we, we know right now that um, we need more, pay more attention to mental health at every level, from children, uh, parents, and uh, directors, because um, without really a, um, a good foundation of how re- uh, resilient you are facing situations that are stressful for you, the better equipped you be. 
And then one other thing that I may, I didn't mention it in my conversation previously uh, to this um, comment is that we, uh, and Los Niños, we have uh, two practice that every child do and the teachers do is mindfulness, which is, uh, is very popular at this time in uh, general in education and yoga. And those two things were the most popular and more attended classes. So that is telling you that is that there, it's some information that us as an educator need to take in consideration. Um, I, I can think about, you know, a couple of lessons we learned from our work in Atlanta. One is early in the pandemic, we deployed a stabilization grant program. And at the time we were hearing that the SBA loan process was just really wonky for childcare providers and they weren't able to access it. And we really benefited from the unique ability to think about the way to flex public private dollars. So while, you know, DECAL was working to determine their grant program, we were able to leverage funds and provide operational support to childcare providers. And the biggest aha was that investment did not stabilize childcare at all, but it did pro allow providers to kind of breathe and say, all right, you know, I have this 20K award. I know one, I can staff my, you know, I can pay my staff. I can kind of breathe and figure out what is it that I need to do to continue to provide services for families and support children. So I think it's just being nimble about ways that we do outreach and even down to the process for that particular population. Um, something else that was an aha actually after reading Dr. C, Dr. Owen's um, survey was we are thinking about facility investments. So as we've built relationships and talked to providers, one thing that we've realized is while there is lots of money coming funding coming down to support providers, we're hearing, but my HVAC, that's really important now because it's safety and you know the quality of air is important. And that's a huge expense, especially when you're missing 50% of your enrollment. So right now we are supporting childcare providers in city of Atlanta with facility investments and to better understand how does that support them or their ability to increase their quality when funding of that amount is just not in the bank to pull down from to address that roof or the HVAC system. So I think it's just like one listening. Um, and I would say also for folks who are in that public private partnership space is not supplanting federal dollars or state dollars, but understanding where you can help fill the gap that public investments aren't reaching until we reach that space where we have enough public investments that um, sufficiently serve families well and support our workforce. I think I would say that the biggest um, takeaway over the past two years or lesson learned is just that childcare operates on extremely narrow margins. They cannot sustain, um, you know, like, you know, you think about the airlines and how they have to be bailed out and whatnot. They, they, um, it's so many more billions of dollars in that industry and childcare is like the most critical infrastructure to our working families so that they can go to work. Um, and so like when you kind of balance the two, it's amazing. But I think that it, it became just so much more apparent in the pandemic than it ever had been before. It was already like, I don't wanna act like we didn't know we knew that um, childcare was underfunded and that, um, that, and that childcare was very expensive for families. And that's the other piece is people pay as much um, for their child to go to childcare as tuition to some colleges. And that's, you know, um, especially with really young children. And, you know, we got to do something about that because everybody needs access. Um, so I think to me, those are sort of the biggest takeaways. Yeah, I would just add on uh, to everything you just said. It, it feels like um, you're pulling at one of the bottom pieces of a Jenga tower <laughs> when, when we talk about a, a child care, early childhood um, system uh, that doesn't have the resources or supports that it needs. Um, one of my colleagues uh, in May of 2020 wrote a report on how um, 
early childhood education and, and pre-K, it, it's not just, you know, a place for your child to be so you can <laughs> have a job. It's also a place to get a, a hot, nutritious meal for a lot of families, several meals uh, for a lot of families. It's early interventions, um, as far as health interventions concerned, being able to spot issues that we know about early on in a child's development. It's a resource center for parents um, to better understand. You know, it's one of the first times we're coming together and interacting with uh, the state government in any sense. And there's this, this way to do that um, where we support families and, and welcome folks in. And a lot of child care centers and pre-K centers are absolutely doing that. And so we saw in the pandemic that it's not just, okay, this is the thing we need to keep family economies going and the, the, the world's economy going. This is also uh, one of the ways that we're kind of holding up health and education infrastructure as well. And uh, another lesson I feel like we learned, or, or one that I took away, is when we saw significant federal investment, and I think I'm kind of jumping into the Q&A, but it's hard not to, when we saw significant federal investment, the ability to expand, uh, expand caps that Elizabeth will be able to talk about much better than I, um, there's this feeling of like, okay, we could have done this. <laughs> we didn't have to wait until there's a pandemic uh, to be able to support low-income families so they could uh, have childcare. We didn't have to wait until there's a pandemic to understand like $16,000 for assistant pre-K teachers. That, that is unsustainable. And uh, shout out to the governor's proposed budget. It will include a $2,000 pay raise for assistant teachers, but that's, that's $18,000 a year. Like we're still several steps away uh, from living wages for these folks that, I mean, my kids who are in pre-K, they they rely on their assistant teacher just as much as they rely on their lead teacher. They don't know which one's got the lead teacher tag. And so I, that was one thing I walked away is we saw what it looks like to have kind of significant investment to support these centers and support the, the people that uh, help them run. And my thought is like, this needs to be a part of the conversation moving forward uh, because we know just kind of how valuable this sector is and these people are. Yes, it's so true. And um, I mean, I just can't, <laughs> I can't, we're very lucky to have a childcare provider who we love. And I just can't imagine, you know, like so many families, um, our lives without our childcare. And then also knowing, you know, at the same time that, you know, one of our childcare providers works a second job at the airport in order to be able to provide for her family um, because she doesn't make enough there at um, her childcare job, even though everyone's like trying to do the best they can and, and no one's like trying to stiff anyone like it, it just is is um, an area where, frankly, the market just like doesn't really work, which is why that we need public supports and investments. Um, so I'll jump into the Q&A here, Stephen. Um, you kind of teed it up with with some of your comments on on federal investments. So, the question here is: What was the impact of federal funding on childcare and pre K, uh, or your program in Georgia? So, anyone that wants to jump in there, I could start us off because we've got quite a bit of the federal funding that came through DCAL. So. DECAL received nearly $2 billion in federal stimulus funds through the CARES Act, which is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act, CRRSA, which is the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, and ARPA, which is the most recent American Rescue Plan Act. We've implemented many initiatives with those funds with a focus on three main areas, providing relief to child care providers, the child care workforce and to families. The main initiative to, to uh, sorry, the main initiative to support these groups were as follows. So we have these things that are a good chunk of this money called stable grants. And these are stabilization grants to child care providers to help offset the cost they incurred to continue operations and of course most importantly continue paying their staff when they had much lower income based on very low enrollment and had to close in some cases, um, also to pay for the, ex the additional costs of operating in the pandemic. 
they had to change their operations. They had to buy PPE. They had to buy things they never had to buy before and had to have smaller group sizes, not mixed groups in the way. So they had to have different staffing and all these things were very expensive. Um, there have actually been several rounds of these grants for licensed childcare providers. The most recent being monthly payments that go through September of 2023 versus one-time payments for the first three rounds that we did. And I think that um, childcare providers are appreciative of that because it's a continuous um, income source. Along those lines, um, we also switched right in the beginning um, of the pandemic uh, I, I want to say it was literally in mid-March of 2020, and we still do it today. We switched our child care subsidy program from paying based on attendance to paying based on enrollment. Now, this is one of those things that if we could afford to do it ongoing, it would definitely infuse the industry and make them much better be able to pay staff and whatnot. So, um, but we, had, we are dependent on extra funding in order to do that. And so what that meant was whether a child was absent or present. So if that family did not feel safe bringing their child into the child care program, as long as they had attended the program while enrolled in CAPS, which is our child care subsidy program, at least one time since um, March of 2020, they were able to bill us for that child all the way through as long as that child had a current active scholarship. So even if the family chose to keep the child home, the center could still, or the family child care provider could still um, bill us for that. Um, and um, let's see. And also, even when programs temporarily close, so that you heard about COVID closures, and you mentioned some classroom closures, Jennifer, in the beginning of this um, um, discussion that happened just recently because of our most recent um, variant. And as programs have had to temporarily close, we are paying them whether they're open or closed as well, which is also very unusual, um, at least pre-pandemic. Um, and they could be closed because of COVID or they could be closed because of lack of staffing. We don't require what the reason is, just that they um, let us know that they closed. And then for the child care workforce, the POWER initiative was implemented. This consisted of making $1,000 payments to teachers directly, to teachers, assistant teachers, directors, and other staff working in child care programs. There will be a total of three rounds. The first payments already went um, out last year. The second round is in process now, and a third round is planned for June. So in all, that would be $3,000 paid directly to those um, staff that work in child care programs. For families, we added a priority group to our child care subsidy program for the essential services workforce for the first six months of the pandemic. So we added people who were working in grocery stores, at hospitals, people who might not have qualified normally were able to qualify um, for CAPS and have help paying for child care during that very challenging time for those folks. Um, then we implemented the SOLVE program, which was supporting on-site virtual learning education. So using the gov governor's emergency education relief funds, this paid for eligible families to send their children to do their virtual learning at a child care program when schools were virtual and parents needed care so that they could go to work. And this, again, had different eligibility requirements than it wasn't part of the CAPS program. You just had to meet certain income and your, ch your child's school had to be primarily virtual. So it wasn't um, um, as many income, I mean, excuse me, eligibility requirements as is typical. And then um, most noteworthy for families in May of 2021, we implemented the Access Initiative and that's awarding child care education scholarship supplements. This meant that our child care subsidy program reimbursed child care providers at their full published rate for children enrolled in CAPS instead of at the subsidy rate. So you may not be aware that subsidy has a state rate and it's not necessarily what the child care provider charges and that families typically have to pay a family fee as well as the difference between the subsidy rate and whatever the child care provider charges. Paying the full cost of tuition, including covering the typical family fees, allowed families enrolled in the subsidy program to direct 
um, those funds that they would have needed to spend on childcare to other costs and other financial needs. Finally, um, and uh, Stephen mentioned this earlier, um, we expanded access to the child care subsidy program most recently this past November to be able to assist more families. We funded an additional 10,000 cap slots and widened eligibility limits to the maximum allowed under federal regulations um, to be able to assist as many families as we possibly could. Um, the other thing that is not really part of federal stimulus dollars, but that we were doing in the program already is that if a child care provider is a um, choosing to serve children in our CAPS program, they are required to be quality rated. We wanted to ensure that the children in this program are receiving high quality care. Um, and that gets at our equity lens and trying to ensure that um, income is not a reason that somebody cannot um, have their child in a high quality early learning environment because we know how critical that is for children's development. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I think as Stephen mentioned earlier, it's sort of like, did we have to wait for a pandemic for some of these, these changes? You know, I'm especially thinking of that sort of enrollment versus attendance change that you mentioned that would be great to have <clears throat> it with additional state investment. So um, very briefly, I had one question that came in uh, about Aside from supports that very clearly and directly support workers, what policies that don't specifically target the workers could support their well-being? So if we just like two minutes <laughs> for this question about just thinking about policies that aren't specific to pre-K and child care workers, but would still support their well-being. Anyone has any thoughts on that? I can, I can hit two real quick ones. One, expand Medicaid in Georgia. Let's start bringing in billions of federal dollars. Let's get people on health insurance so it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to their job, uh, specifically for low-income Georgians. Um, and second, let's, uh, let's get an EITC, a, a tax credit for working families so we get more money in the pockets of these folks. This is gonna, this is gonna help a ton of Georgians, not just those in this space, but uh, specifically, a lot of those folk, folks in the care space um, end up in these uh, lower income positions, just like what you mentioned. And those are two things that would go just a long way uh, for, for a lot of Georgians. So, but I'll, I'll see the rest of the time. Thank you. And I know Maritza, you mentioned mental health uh, supports before, I think which intersects um, with healthcare access. Um, certainly something that is, is very needed for mm -hmm. many folks. Yes. So, um, so we need to wrap up this panel now. And I just want to thank you to all of our panelists for their time today. Uh, and for everyone watching at home, we invite you to continue connecting with each other and our panelists within the conference platform. You can message each other, you can message the panelists, you can message me in there. Uh, and then also, uh, before we conclude, I just want to highlight three events that are coming up today in our conference. And so in order to join those, um, the next session or any of those events, you just have to close out of the tab that you're in now and go back to the schedule and then click on the next item. So we're gonna have a short break right now, but don't miss our keynote panel at 3 p.m. So um, we have a virtual networking session starting at 4.15. Um, which will be based on sort of like policy interest. And then also this evening, there's a very special grassroots advocacy training at 7 p.m. So you should see all those in your schedule. Just again, um, close out of this tab and go back to the schedule and you can click on the next item that you would like to attend today. So thank you so much for your uh, interest and attention. Thank you so much for our panelists for joining us today. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.